Greetings, everyone around the country and around the world. I'm Michael O'Hanlon with the Foreign Policy Program at the Brookings Institution, and today we are here to have a Zoom session to discuss the prospects for political reform, security, and prosperity in the Democratic Republic of Congo, a country that I was privileged to serve as a Peace Corps volunteer in 40 years ago, and that has been making its way slowly uh, and with difficulty into the democratic world of nations this century, now planning to hold what will be its fourth presidential election of the century under the 2006 constitution. That election is scheduled for December of this year and uh, President Xi Shikedi is expected to be a candidate. We also are very privileged today to have with us the Honorable Martin Fayulu, who we also hope will be a candidate and has been and, and was believed by many to have won the presidential election, at least in vote count, last time around and is planning to run this time. But we are here not as an organization to uh, have a campaign rally, of course, but to really foster dialogue and discussion as to what Congo's main needs are, what policies may serve its people best, and also may strengthen its democracy in this important and fateful upcoming season culminating, uh, we expect, in December elections. So the way we will proceed today is that I will have a conversation for about a half hour, informed partly by your questions that have already been received and any that come in to events at brookings.edu. Again, that's events at brookings.edu. You may send additional questions that way, but uh, the Honorable Mr. Fayulu and I will talk for about a half hour, at which point I will then bring in a panel that I'll introduce at that time, which is to preview. It will include Jason Stearns, um, Fred Bama, and um, Mvemba Dizolele from CSIS, and Stephanie Walters from the South Africa Institute for International Affairs. And I will uh, introduce all of them. We're privileged to have them from all over the world joining us on Zoom. And that's the purpose, of course, that this conversation is on Zoom. Mr. Fayulu is in Kinshasa, and uh, that's where he was born. He served in a distinguished career in the private sector in ExxonMobil jobs for a number of decades, finally uh, culminating in leading Exxon's efforts in Ethiopia. He became a member of parliament under the 21st century constitution of the DRC and uh, has served again in that distinguished body as well as being the candidate that led the opposition and received by most observers believe about 60%, 62% of the vote tally last time around. So Mr. Fayulu, welcome to Brookings. Thank you very much for joining us. We are honored to have you, sir. And I look forward very much to our conversation. Over to you for a word of greeting, if you like. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for being here, participating in this session. I'm, uh, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to talk about Congo. Congo is a vast land. It's a country with 110 million inhabitants today but it's a country that everybody has almost forgotten. And I really want Congo to be on the loop. Congo, uh, because Congo has many things to offer to the world. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, sir. So if I could, I'd like to begin right away with, I know an issue that's been so central to your concern and which strikes me as a fairly nonpartisan issue because it has to do with empowering the Congolese people to vote. And I know that you have been very concerned about developing an accurate vote tally or registration process and giving every Congolese citizen of appropriate age the opportunity to register for the vote. That's been a contentious issue in previous elections. How is it going as we sit here on August 14th, only about four months before the election is meant to be held? How do you feel about the preparation process so far? The preparation is a chaos, really chaos, because what you have to know that uh, Mr. Chiseke didn't win the last election and uh, he put in place a system for him to uh, now uh, you know, gain the election. And um, now we arrive at the time of voter registration. We promoted that um, exercise. We told everybody to go and uh, register themselves as voters. But the Electoral Commission has run a process without any transparency. And uh, we, in our team, our team called LAMUCA, 
we put in place a coordination to follow up everything that Seni was doing. And we come up with the situation that the electoral file is totally false. And then we said, we told, uh, as everybody, civil society, and so more the, uh, um, you know, runners, we told Seni, okay, now we need a, an external audit. So the external audit can assess if the electoral file is correct or not. And the electoral commission said no way. And he uh, took five friends of the president to run the audit for five days. And they come up with a report which is totally false and no consistency, nothing there, no uh, weaknesses, no for, uh, you know, strength and recommendation to strengthen the file. That's what we are saying today. Uh, in 2018, we had electoral file with more than 10 million fake voters. And then this time around, they push to have a semi-electronic uh, voters vote. And with that semi-electronic vote, they prepare themselves also to have fake voters so they can send the results through the electronic system. And then Mr. Chisekedi, with those fake voters prepared, and uh, he will win. This is the simplest way for him to win the election. Then we said, OK, now it looks like we are accompanying Mr. Chisekedi um, for him to win the election. And we said, OK, step, stop. Let us call for an independent. But that semi doesn't want. The Catholic Church and the Protestant Church, they came two weeks ago. They said the same. Please, we cannot go with a electoral register that nobody knows what is in there. And the semi say, no way. That's why. We, myself and my team, and some others, Congolese uh, political parties, we are saying, if it's uh, to go and accompany Chisekedi, why doing that? We will continue to have a legitimacy uh, president in this country. Thank you very much. I should also clarify for our viewers that we did invite the office of President Xi Shikedi to be part of this conversation today, and most specifically the Congolese ambassador to the United States. We understand that she may not have felt uh, that she was available or able to make this event, and we certainly mean no um, ill intent, but we did try to make this ecumenical uh, and hope that we can in the future. In fact, uh, President Xi Shikedi, before he was president, was scheduled to be part of a Brookings event in 2018. A visa issue precluded that, but then he came and visited me at Brookings privately in that same season prior to uh, the election of 2018. So again, uh, we do and will continue to try to represent a broad range of Congolese voices. But I know, Mr. Fayulu, that your voice represents a wide range of Congolese already because you were indeed the consensus opposition candidate in 2018 through a, a, a wide group of parties, and as noted, uh, received a very hefty percentage of that vote by anybody's reckoning. And so if I could ask you just one follow-up question about this independent commission, uh, and I'm not an expert on elections, but I've observed elections in Afghanistan and studied to some extent the efforts to build democracies elsewhere. I wonder if you could say a bit more about what kind of a commission with what kind of representation would satisfy your concerns and in your judgment really help push along this registration process correctly. Look, the first thing is this, the electoral commission today is comprises only with Chisekedi's people. Chisekedi has put in place a coalition called Union, Sacred Union for the Nation. And um, he has the uh, 15 people in that uh, electoral commission are members of uh, Sacred Union. And we said, no way, it's not impartial. We continue to say that uh, that commission should be 
uh, changed. And uh, if they keep the president because he belongs to the churches, if the churches say they don't have any issue with him, we also don't have an issue. But what about the other members that should belong to other uh, stakeholders? We want that to happen. Secondly, uh, when they uh, started the uh, uh, electoral process, they called for the bid, the bid to buy uh, machines, to buy kits uh, for the registration. And they think it was really, really uh, not transparent. And then when they bought those machines, we say that, okay, now give us the number of machine you bought, the number of uh, cards you printed and where you send them so we can see uh, uh, and then go make control. How many you still have in stock? We can reconcile all those figures to see what is going on. The uh, SENI, the Electoral Commission say no way. But when they started the process, we found out the two car accident in the back countries. And the, the two car accident, they found the machine, they found papers, they found, you know, electoral card. And the SENI issue a statement saying that, okay, we take that issue to the justice and we will let you know what's happened. Until today, nothing uh, uh, that uh, uh, SENI didn't communicate anything. Then we said to SENI, we had the meeting on June 30th, myself and the three other candidates and the president of SENI. We said, okay, you have gone ahead, continue. Let us, at this uh, stage, we continue the activities that you put in your calendars. But in the same time, let us call for the external audit. And if the external audit comes and say that, okay, everything is okay, we continue. And then we, my uh, coalition called LAMUCA, we will file our documents. But if the file is not okay, according to the, um, the, the, the um, audit, then we reshuffle everything, then we, we, we restart. The guy say, okay, I have to go and ask uh, my colleague, and then I'll come back to you. But my uh, auditors, they have told me that I have to publish the list, by publishing the list, you can see what is going on. We told him that publishing the list is a must, is already in the law. You should do that. You should have even do that before the, 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 um, the interim list. You should have done that. You didn't do that. But today, publishing the list cannot replace the external audit. That's, that's where we are. And... Um, I don't know if somebody really in today I can accept that participating in the election, he doesn't know the number of voters, the quality of voters. And then they tell him that, okay, when you vote, the machine will transfer the result to the central server, and then they will proclaim the result. If at all, uh, you have a dis discrepancy with the uh, number from the uh, electronic vote and the number for the manual counting, then you have to go to the center. During the, that center, SENI will issue the uh, process and then you will sign the paper and then, then you will contest later on. How can someone agree on that process? That's where we stand and we say, no way. We have told Congolese, we cannot have elections in this country if we don't have a clean um, electoral file. Thank you for the explanation. It's much appreciated. And now if I could, I'd like to turn to the policy agenda facing your country and the kinds of ideas that you think should be debated among the candidates, obviously you need a fair process and a fair vote as a 
prerequisite to any kind of meaningful democratic election. And so I understand why you focus so much on the voter registration and transparency and accountability questions. But I'd like to hear a little bit about your vision for the country and the kinds of issues you think that the candidates in general should be discussing uh, and debating and trying to implement it, it once there's a winner and once there's a parliament also chosen by the voters. And I guess, you know, one natural place to start is the economy, because maybe that can even give us a little bit of good news in a conversation that will have a number of tough spots. I know a lot of our panelists will talk about the violence in the East. Uh, there are other concerns with governance in Congo today. But the good news, apart from just the heart and spirit of the Congolese people that you and I know so well and admire so much, is that the GDP growth rate in Congo has actually been quite good for a couple of years. Now, this does not reach everyone equally. Part of it's driven by mineral exploitation that's not always done fairly uh, and not always done legally. But I would still like to have your thoughts, sir, on how you feel the Congolese economy is doing right now and how it can do even better in the future, if you don't mind addressing that question, please. Yeah, the Congolese economy is doing really bad and the people are starving. Uh, we have poverty uh, in this country, everywhere. More than 80% of Congolese are unemployed. And um, we um, uh, import uh, what we are eating and um, we have minerals. Uh, when you talk about GDP growth, all this go as because of the minerals, okay? And, um, but the money coming in the country has been going to the pocket of uh, those who are running the country. We had some program. We had a program called, called 100 Days Program of 560 million US dollars. And uh, the money disappeared. Nobody knows exactly when the money went. We had a program, another program called Tilejilu. Uh, Tilejilu is in the Luba language. Okay, and that Tilejulu program of 130 million US dollars. Today, nobody has seen any concrete uh, realization in, uh, uh, on the ground. We had a, uh, a, a theft, uh, Mr. Kamere, who was uh, the uh, you know, chief of staff of Mr. K K K Chisekedi, and he was involved in the uh, $57 million uh, that disappeared. And uh, that 57 million, Mr. Kamere was jailed. He was in jail for almost two years, but now he is out without uh, reimbursing money uh, to the, um, the country, but now he has been appointed as Minister of Economy. We had another 15 million from the petroleum you know, side. And the, uh, today, when Mr. Chisekedi come up to power and the dollars, one dollar was 1,000, just a round figure, 1,700 um, uh, Congolese francs. And today, one dollar is 2,400 plus uh, uh, Congolese francs. You know, more than 50%, uh, okay, that uh, the money uh, uh, lost as the value. And uh, today, uh, Congolese, uh, we need more, uh, oh, sorry, 27 million of Congolese, we need humanitarian assistance, 27 million. You know, and then we don't have money. And uh, we uh, cannot, organize uh, uh, anything. And the, the economy uh, is, uh, uh, you know, uh, people cannot find um, the way uh, to, to, to live the, the good life uh, because the, the few money coming in is really go for uh, enrichment, illicit enrichment. That, that the economy, and today, nobody can tell you, they here in Kinshasa, Kinshasa has 17, one seven, 17 million people because everybody in the back country, they try to come in Kinshasa and to fund how 
to have a better life. And then you have insecurity. Uh, you have, um, uh, you know, some young guy who uh, try to commit uh, uh, really uh, fraud and uh, theft in the in the in the city. Well, yes, it's a difficult message to hear, but thank you for the clear explanation of how you see the economic challenges. I thought I would turn briefly now to the East and the ongoing difficulty, instability, and violence there, as well as the role of various foreign or even transnational actors, whether it's ISIS or another group. And I have really two questions about the East and the, the stability of DRC more generally. One is, could you just help the general audience here, including myself, understand where we are in 2023 compared to previous decades? Are things about the same in the East? Are they getting worse? Are they getting a little better? I know they're still bad. There's still a lot of violence, a lot of insecurity, and a real lack of development. And I know people like uh, Stephanie Walters and Jason Stearns and others on the panel will discuss this and have done a lot of field research in that area, but I'm sure you have views as well. So could you help us understand where things are, but also what the current what the current options are, what needs to happen to make the East safer? We still have a UN mission in Congo, but it's been there a long time. It's not clear if it's making any real progress. It's not clear if the Congolese military is getting more capable and more able to control the East. It's not clear if foreign actors are becoming more or less dangerous. So how do you see today compared to previous years? and what needs to happen next? The uh, situation is worsening. It's getting worse and worse. Uh, you should know that uh, Mr. Chisekedi came to power um, with the complicity of Mr. Kagame. They were uh, close friends and they make the deal, the two of them, Mr. Kabila, Kagame, and uh, Chisekedi, uh, because uh, Kagame uh, found that uh, if Fayulu around the country and uh, he will uh, really address issues that uh, Congo is uh, facing, uh, meaning that uh, we will try to stop the war in the Eastern part of Congo. And uh, then we will uh, try to have a good cooperation between countries, uh, neighboring countries to find how uh, to alleviate uh, poverty in all countries and uh, to uh, boost the democracy in the country. And today, um, even yesterday, one of locality in uh, Ruchuru has been taken, the uh, locality by the name of Busanza has been taken by uh, the uh, M23. As you know that the M23, we had it in 2012, but the Congolese uh, uh, forces, uh, the army forces, fought and uh, pushed out the M23. And now, suddenly, the M23 came back uh, uh, last year. And we really don't know how this happened. It was the, uh, when Chisekedis and Kagame, they were too close, very close, and signed some deeds. And they even signed the deal that uh, Congo has to join the Eastern African community. And I don't know why Chisekedi pushed Congo to Eastern African community. And today, many, the North Kivu, part of North Kivu is out of control of the government. You, if you go to Ituri, and uh, part of Ituri is out of uh, Congo, government, uh, Congolese authority. And then what Chisekedi did almost two years now, uh, more than two years, he uh, put in place what he called state of uh, siege and where the military is uh, uh, running the country, is running the two uh, provinces without any major, uh, you know, improvement. But what we had would decrease people, they continue to kill people. And even today, Mr. Chisekedi has, found, has called for a meeting um, to fund how to get rid of state of siege. And I don't know because 
uh, in his agenda, some people are saying that he wants to change the constitution, but the uh, National Assembly or the Congress cannot change it if we are under state of siege. Uh, I don't know if it's true, but this is the rumor that's going on here. The situation is in the East is just uh, uh, cold or worsened because of uh, the um, relationship that Chisekedi had with Mr. Kagame, and he signed many deals, and he brought uh, M23, which are really the Rwanda's army, and uh, they are in our country, and it looks like now they made a kind of uh, agreement they have to separate, to distance themselves, uh, to tell Congolese that they are not agreeing, uh, two of them. But for me, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a game. Thank you. So I have two more questions, and then I will thank you very much for helping us today to understand the issues facing Congo and bring in our panel. One question is going to be a follow-up on the East, and then I'm going to ask you about China and its role, because as you know, for Americans and for many others, uh, watching China's role in Africa has become a very important issue of broader concern and it could be good and bad for Congo, could be good and bad for U.S.-China relations. So I want to finish on that. But first, if I could follow up with your discussion of security in the East, sir. And what I heard you explain just now was that in your, uh, in your judgment, a lot of the difficulty and danger and violence comes from the role of Rwanda, and a role that perhaps the current president of Congo has not found a way to discourage and perhaps has even become complicit. I wonder, is, is your agenda for Eastern Congo primarily about getting tougher on foreign actors, maybe Rwanda in particular, or do you have other aspects of your policy agenda that you would want to explain to us today? For example, does the UN force need to get better or bigger for a while, even though it's been there for a long time? Does the Congolese military need a different kind of technical assistance from the outside world for a certain period as it tries to improve its own capacity for operating in those very remote areas of the East? Is there anything else you would want to add to the agenda? Yeah, to the agenda as the solution uh, to end uh, violence and war in the East, first of all, the international community has to find a solution for those guys called the FDLR, because Mr. Kagame is uh, taking his cues to, um, you know, uh, come to Congo with his forces because he's saying that he's pursuing the FDLR. The international community has to, first of all, to let us know how many of those guys there are to, uh, 1,000, 2,000, uh, 1, 2,000, or how many? And then if they can take the FDLR, send them away uh, from Congo, another country on Europe or Australia, I don't know. This is, I think, the first thing to do. The second thing is to change the mission of uh, the MONUSCO. The MONUSCO has to have a robust mission, like we had in 1960, when we get our, we got our independence, we had a mission uh, called Mon, uh, uh, Mission des Nations Unies au Congo, you know, UN mission in Congo. But that mission had, you know, the um, uh, mandate to fight. We need a mission, a robust mission, they can fight and to bring peace. We need a mission to bring peace in Congo and to push away uh, all those guys who want part of Congo. And also, we need something like uh, Congo and Rwanda, Burundi, or neighboring country has to sit down together and to find a way, how can they collaborate? How can have a peace in the region? We need that instead of Mr. Kagame going in some African country saying that he wants to request some land in, in Congo. The solution lies uh, on that. We are not part of uh, uh, those guys who are saying that uh, a UN mission or MONUSCO should leave the country. MONUSCO leaving the country today, it will be a disaster. 
uh, because we'll not have any eyes to see what is going on there. We need to change the mandate of uh, uh, MONUSCO. That's, that's I think, uh, what we should do um, for MONUSCO and for the UN, and also the uh, European country or the UN countries, all of them, mainly the European, the American, even the African country. Each country should condemn um, Rwanda for what he is doing. And uh, I see that the Secretary General issue uh, during his, the, the last um, um, you know, report he uh, issued is not talking about any involvement of Rwanda um, with the M23. I find it strange, but why the experts have said that uh, Rwanda is involved, uh, Rwanda is backing the M23, can't understand. This is the lack of uh, diplomacy of Congo, and uh, Mr. Kagame has gained confidence in the world. But what is important for the world? To have Congo with 100 million habitants, 2.3 million square kilometers, with all resources we have, with the forest, water, and you know cobalt and so on. And uh, but all you want a small country of 13 million and disturbing the whole world. We we should have really. Uh, we, we, we have to make choice, but we are not saying that Rwanda should be expelled. We are not saying that Rwanda should be forgotten. We are saying we need the peace uh, in the region by starting with peace in Congo, having the real uh, election in the Congo, the transparent election, because the problem of Congo is that illegitimacy of the uh, uh, people ruling the country um, by not being competent, because Mr. Chisekedi, as everybody knows, he doesn't, he's not capable. He's not capable to run a country with uh, that importance that the country has. That's, that's really uh, something that the world should uh, look at. So thank you. Let me ask one final question. And of course, we could talk about this all day, but I'm really just looking for a fairly brief assessment from your point of view about China's role in Congo today, it's quite considerable. I wonder if you see it as mostly good, mostly worrying. Uh, if you see the US, China, and European China rivalries as potentially harmful to Congo, or it, are these competitions potentially healthy by giving Kinshasa options for different foreign investors or other? kinds of missions, other kinds of technical assistance efforts. So if you could help us just in, in a nutshell, understand the role of China in Congo today, please. Yeah, I'm wondering with uh, those that competition between China, US, even Russia, uh, because that competition can lead us or lead the uh, democratic country to see, oh, let's forget about what is going on and if Chisekedi rigged the election and he won it uh, because he may go and uh, offer himself to China on the Russia. Uh, we, we, the, you, the, the, the US, France, Germany, uh, UK, uh, Senegal, and the other countries in the world, they are uh, teaming up with other countries. The relationship has to go with everybody. We are in the one world today. We should have relationship with everybody. But the first thing is we should have democracy. The first thing we should have transparency. The first thing is we the money of the country should go to the real project to really uh, alleviate the poverty of Congolese and for their well um, um, welfare. But we cannot uh, team up uh, with the uh, countries just because we have to team up and uh, uh, no transparency, no real interest for the Congo. We should have the win-win, uh, you know, uh, partnership. Uh, the country uh, should win, Congo also should win. What I recommend that 
we should look at the relation that is profitable for Congo. Congo needs everybody, but Congo needs the relationship that will help his uh, uh, people and uh, to uh, go ahead in terms of uh, uh, human being, in terms of, um, uh, how do you call it, uh, the, um, um, the violation of um, uh, human rights. Okay, that's what I want to say. The human rights should be focused and nobody can come and do relationship with Congo, whereas the government is uh, violating uh, human rights of, uh, of Congo. We need all this. The uh, rule of law should prevail and democracy, um, you know, um, pillar should prevail so we can go ahead and uh, help our country. We have many resources. We have 110 uh, billion people and uh, we have uh, people with competencies and uh, we can run our country. We need everybody, Indians, Chinese, American, European, and but for a good game and no a, a false game. Thank you very much. Sir, we've been privileged to have you. I understand you may stay on and uh, you know, perhaps we'll give you the floor one last time as we conclude in about an hour, but I'm now going to bring in the broader panel. So we're gonna do a little swap of, of television cameras as Mr. Feyulu says goodbye for the moment and turns his camera off. Everyone else can please turn their camera on. Uh, unfortunately in the audience, you'll be stuck with me either way. So that part's not gonna change, but I'd now like to begin introducing the panelists. And again, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. I see up on my upper left uh, Jeopardy box, Mbemba Fezo Dizolele, a good friend of mine, a longstanding a scholar within Washington, but also a man of remarkable accomplishment as a journalist, as a uh, Congolese, as a person who deployed with peacekeepers and covered their work some years ago. He's been an election observer worked for various organizations like the Foreign Service Institute and the International Republican Institute. He teaches at SICE in Washington, and that's where Stephanie Walters got her degree in Africa Studies. She also is an experienced journalist and now resides in South Africa, where she's part of the South Africa Institute for International Affairs and also is a consultant with OCAPO and uh, has done work for the uh, newspaper industry in Africa, the BBC, covered Congo itself, and also is currently working on a research project that looks at the interaction of the various countries in Eastern Congo that we just heard Mr. Feyulu talk about. So we'll look forward to her insights. Jason Stearns is at Simon Fraser University in Canada. He also, along with Fred Balma, whom I'll introduce in a moment, is affiliated with New York University and the Center, Center for International Cooperation, uh, where they've also developed the Congo Research Group over the years. Uh, Jason is a very experienced and diligent field researcher, also a very accomplished author with a particular flair for some of the best titles in the history of writing on Africa. Dancing in the Glory of Monsters was his book of some years ago, and more recently, a book called La Guerre qui ne dit pas son nom, The War That Doesn't Say Its Name, really talking about the ongoing violence in Eastern Congo and how it's a a conflict that the world can easily forget, but really should not, and that continues to do such devastation to the country. And finally, Fred Bama, uh, who is a, a remarkable Congolese himself, based in New York now, uh, but has been imprisoned for his uh, efforts to promote human rights and democracy in Congo during a previous regime, and uh, survived even under a death sentence for uh, 18 months in prison, has emerged as a Again, remarkable researcher. He and Jason together also run a blog, which brings together voices from across Africa about social and political change and activism. And we're really delighted to have him with us as well today. So if I could just say to the panel, thank you. Uh, a, a real treat to have you here. And the way we're going to proceed in the 50 minutes we have left is I'm just going to ask two simple questions and ask each person to respond in turn. And the first question is going to be to set the stage to tell us in three or four minutes what you consider the most important current realities about Congo to understand today. And of course, I'm hoping that there'll be some diversity of the subjects you cover and we'll get a little bit of a lay of the land on politics, economics, 
security, perhaps the US-China and uh, NATO-China competitions to the extent that's relevant. But whatever you see is the most important scene setter that perhaps generalists or even Congo watchers don't fully understand or appreciate. And then a second question really is going to be an open-ended question about the most important policy agenda for Congo going forward, including what needs to happen to make these elections successful, but then building on that to also help enhance Congo's future prosperity and stability. So by previous uh, understanding and agreement, Mvemba, if I could, I'm going to begin with you and ask you to help us understand Congo today. Again, thanks to everyone and over to the panel. I think you're still on mute, my friend. Thank you very much, Mike, for inviting us. It's a pleasure to join you and the rest of my co-panelists. The, um, the DRC is yet again at the crossroad, an important one, but the DRC has been at this crossroad for the last long time. Um, those of us who follow the election closely, it's always a sense of a deja vu. 2006, some people boycott the election, some people get out of the process. The civil society then is left uh, to be kind of the arbiter and push this uh, process forward. We saw that again in 2011, similar thing. There's always a bit of cyber rattling, a little bit of boycott, a little bit of all this. So every time, every cycle, 2018, you know, we saw really in uh, was supposed to be 2016, civil society get involved and save the day as President Kabila was trying to extend his time in office. There was hope there in 2016, um, but thanks Puli, it was primarily due to the push of civil society and other activist group and uh, advocacy group. Politicians in Congo in many ways have been a disappointment because they create what I've come to call and many of us call Congo fatigue. You know, every five years, the movie start again, different twists, same characters, same actors, and then we expect a different result. This time we have literally the same issue. Uh, we have a uh, president of the electoral commission who comes with a lot of credibility having worked for AISA and so on. But then we had the president who came with a lot of credibility last time, Kone Nanga. And eventually nothing seemed to fall exactly in place. This is due in part because of the system itself, right? The system itself whereby people are sent to the parliament but do not necessarily represent the people they, who sent them there. And this create a Congo fatigue inside Congo where we find ourselves today, we're not sure if people will show up to vote because even though we say 40,000, uh, 45 million people have been registered, uh, we've had uh, 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 Mr. Martin Fayulu talk about the position. So on one side, we have the usual. We have the incumbent who has the power, who's consolidate, consolidating his power. We know President Chisekedi appoint a new government, which some of us call the electoral government. It's a government that represents heavy weight from different parts of the country that will help deliver the election uh, victory to him, hopefully, the way they see it uh, in December. We have reports of people who don't want to participate. And that, of course, is not going to change much, unfortunately, because the train is on track for the incumbent. And the incumbent is benefiting for everything that an incumbent benefits from anywhere in the world. They have the gravitas, they have the momentum, they have a legacy they can show, they have accomplishment they can tell people whether people agree or not. And then of course they have access to state coffers. Uh, in terms of the economy, um, it is problematic now because we hear a lot, Mike, you just mentioned GDP growth rate and so all that stuff. I think that's IMF speak, World Bank speak, if you ask the average person sitting in Gujimai, in Kamina, in Basankusu, if they've seen any change in their daily lives, there's no change. In fact, it's gotten worse. The rate of the dollar, inflation, and so on, that is not translating in every day's life. Uh, when it comes to the spirit of the, the election itself, it's also very tense, not just because of the conflict in the East, 
But the psychosis of arrests, the psychosis caused just recently by the gunning down of a MP, Sheribin Okende, and also a former minister. So that sent some message that creates a certain discomfort in the country. I will end with uh, the side of the opposition and the peace in the East. The opposition once again is absolutely divided. We saw co coalition tend to form, but don't really take any shape. And in the end, people cannot really line themselves behind the opposition because it's really fragmented. Uh, in terms of peace, I think here we are reaping the consequences of lack of creative creativity between Kampala, Kigali, and Kinshasa. Deals have happened over the last decade, but it's always individual deals. It's Kabila and Kagame, Kabila and Museveni, it's so-and-so, there's a new process. Uh, you know, President uh, uh, Martin Fayulu, Mr. Fayulu talked about all these deals. It's very individualized. And eventually we get this ping pong. Rwanda blames Congo, Congo blames Uganda, Uganda blames Congo, and so on. We lack institutional peace. In other words, you cannot make peace between individuals. You make peace between countries. It gotta be beyond President Kagame, it gotta be beyond President Kabila, beyond President Chisekedi. So we've seen uh, um, a set of processes take place that are very opaque. We see deals, they get announced, handshakes, high fives, and so on. It doesn't change anything on the ground. So the plea I have is eventually, it's more than time for Kigali, for Kinshasa, to have peace, like peace everywhere else. You have delegation that meet, hammer out the differences and set up the course. So I'll I'll pause there and we can continue that's, with my call. That's great. Yeah, you've also set up my second question about policy agenda going forward. So I'll turn to that in a moment. But please, Fred, over to you. Welcome. It's a privilege to have you with us. And I look forward to hearing your assessment about how things are in Congo today with whatever subject or issue you'd like to emphasize most, please. Thank you very much, Michael, and good to see uh, all of my, my fellows here. Um, I think in terms of where DRC is now, um, it had to, to start with the electoral process uh, because um, this is the fourth electoral cycle since the uh, end of the war, it, since the, the peace agreement uh, 20 years ago. And that uh, peace agreement came with uh, a lot of um, promises of, of uh, change, democracy, and of legitimacy crisis. And what we've seen so far is four electoral cycles where on every cycle, the quality of the electoral process is, is, um, is becoming worse and worse to the point where, as Mr. Fayoud mentioned, in 2018, we don't even know when, uh, like, who, what were the result, uh, uh, other than the the uh, leaks of from the Seni and the uh, and the Catholic Church. And this election tend to be um, seems to be the same way. We don't. There is a big question on the voter register. Um, I think it's a matter of being. Uh, the the uh, different stakeholders want to be to have guarantees that they are uh, giving the way uh, the the voter register was constituted and and giving many incidents including um, some ident unidentified uh, registered centers they would like to see an audit and there is no audit uh, and the CNE has been actually clear that it will not undergo any additional audit so. And this is this is coming after uh, a series of failed reforms since the last election on on the electoral process. So on the, on, on on democracy, I think, and, and the electoral processes, we can say that where the country is is on the um, eve of a fourth electoral process, uh, which will only demonstrate, I believe, that the uh, level of democracy is uh, the democracy is going is going down in general, and this is not only due to the quality of of technical um, organization of the electoral process; it's also in terms of political participation in this process. We we 
uh, during we, we had a uh, polling early last year and and early this year, I believe. And what we what we are seeing, the trend we are seeing in our pollings is that um, the people who are saying they are willing to go to vote if the election were to be organized the next Sunday are uh, um, um, going uh, down more and more. As an example, in 2018, there were almost 90% um, of people who were willing to go to vote if uh, there were election to be organized. And um, this year, there were around less than 50% who were willing to go to vote. And this is something we see uh, constantly, we've seen constantly uh, since the beginning. And the level of trust in the institution, all institutions, uh, is going down also. The uh, the CENI, the, the Office of the President, the, the government, the parliament, and so on. So that is one thing where uh, we are today. What we are also is that the, um, the uh, security situation in the East, and I, th I think J Jason and Stephanie will come back to this, is getting worse in terms of the number of the number of uh, armed groups, in terms of the number of IDPs, the uh, internal displaced people. Actually, we have more internal displaced people today than any any time in the past, uh, even in the highest uh, time of, of, of conflict. Uh, and maybe in terms of um, where the country is also is is we are experiencing a highest level of inequality uh, in, in DRC. There is, as Vemba was saying, growth in terms of GDP. I think if you see where the country was uh, 20 years ago and today, we can say there, is a, there was a, a lot of change. Uh, the budget was some hundreds of million and now I think the official figures uh, goes to uh, more than 10 billion. Um, but in terms of the reality of an average Congolese, I think uh, things haven't changed significantly. Uh, one example of this is, is that the salaries of MPs, of member of the parliament in Kinshasa, have went from uh, one, like 1,500 during the transitional uh, uh, parliament. So this is 23, 26 to more than $20,000 uh, today. Whereas the salary of a school teacher didn't change that much. They didn't, I think it didn't um, double. So right. this is a country where we, you have a lot of resources. You have the production of copper, the production of, of cobalt uh, increasing significantly. And the people who are benefiting from this are either companies or politicians in Kinshasa. The rest of the country um, doesn't have uh, uh, much thing. So, uh, to, and to finish here, I think ele election and democracy should be um, a, a one of priority from for in in this uh, in the, in this phase. But other than that, I think people want to see more in terms of uh, concrete and sound policies uh, on, on the security and foreign um, policy and also uh, policies to reduce inequality in the country. Yes, yeah, so and we'll come back to that in the second round. Thank you. That was a very good framing. Jason, thank you for joining and over to you, my friend. Thanks, Mike. Uh, good to see all my friends and colleagues. Good to see Mr. Fayulu here. Thank you very much. I think my job here is to talk a little bit about the East. Uh, and to try to link this, and I think there's obvious connections to the electoral situation in Kinshasa, as Fred and Mr. Fayulu have pointed out, the security situation in the East has gotten worse. Today, there are 6.2 million IDPs. That is close to the high point of IDPs in Congolese history, at least according to what we've tracked or what the UN has tracked. So that's, uh, that's almost twice as many IDPs as there were in the Congo at the height of the Great Congo War. And yet we're in a post-conflict situation. And so that shows you a little bit the paradox that we're in. People are treating the conflict in the East, uh, largely speaking, as a technical problem. Um, there is no broad speaking. Uh, there's no broad political approach. There is no real peace process with regards to the East. And yet 6.2 million people, uh, that is the entire number of people who live in the province where I live in British Columbia, 
are displaced in the DRC. Um, there is one armed group that's, uh, that is making the headlines. That's the M23 Rebellion for good reasons. It is since its resurgence in November of 20, uh, 2021, it has threatened the regional capital of Goma. It is an armed group with extensive backing by neighboring countries, in particular the Rwandan government. And so therefore, obviously, it makes headlines. Uh, it is the primary source of or the primary focus for the Congolese government in terms of security in the East. The Congolese government has a tendency to say security in the East is being driven by this problem. Uh, and so therefore, you know, that's, that's, there's a justified focus on the M23 uh, and on the complicity and support of neighboring countries. And yet it is only one of over 100 armed groups. Uh, the IDP figure I gave you of 6.2 million, only I think about 10% of those IDPs can be attributed to the M23 rebellion. The rest are other armed groups. It is not the deadliest armed group. That title goes to the ADF, an Islamist group uh, of or Ugandan origin, as well as Kodeko, which is a militia in the Turi province. Uh, and so this is a real fractal, fragmented situation in the East with not one particular string one can pull to, uh, to disentangle this cat's cradle of violence. Uh, the one, uh, so two points i like to make with regards to the East. With regards to the M23, as Mr. Fayulu has pointed out, as Fred alluded to, you can't tackle the M23 crisis without tackling the regional problems. This is a geopolitical problem. Uh, the M23 crisis began through geopolitical competition between uh, Uganda and Rwanda in the East. Uh, it is part of Uganda and Rwanda's both uh, efforts to maintain influence and control over the Eastern Congo for a variety of reasons, including economic reasons. They derive enormous benefit from instability in the Eastern Congo. The, the top export of both Rwanda, Uganda and Burundi at the moment is gold, and most of that gold comes from the Eastern DRC. Um, yeah, about half of Rwanda's exports uh, I think last year were uh, consisted of gold from the DRC, and so you can see you can see the regional economic concern with regards to the M23. And in response to this, the international community, and this is the perversity of the situation, the international community still funds an enormous amount of Rwanda's uh, expenses and expenditures. Uh, they're very close to the Ugandan government as well. They fund a large part of Burundi's expenditures as well. And yet, that international community has not only done very little aside from condemn the support. Uh, it has gone for it to hold uh, important international meetings. So the, the Commonwealth head of, uh, head of State Summit was held uh, last year in Kigali. A whole host of other summits were held in Kigali. Paul Kagame continues to travel internationally and be feted uh, internationally, included by the United Nations for, you know, for good reason. They've done uh, amazing things and other things. And yet it's, it seems to be impossible to walk and chew gum at the same time for most international diplomats. And so I think there is an international complicity with regards to that situation and much, much more that can be done by international diplomats with regards to solving the geopolitical contours of that question. But getting back to the large security issue, which is not just M23, uh, the common denominator is the Congolese state. And this is where it connects to uh, the elections. The Congolese state since Joseph Kabila, since Mobutu, has treated the security services um, largely not as a source of, uh, not as a means to provide a public good, security, uh, but uh, has seen the security services as a threat. And so therefore has ruled and managed the security services through fragmentation uh, and through patronage, deploying them far away from the capital to keep them away from coups as we've seen elsewhere in Africa. Uh, and so majority of the security services are deployed a thousand miles from Kinshasa in, in the east, uh, where they allow them to enrich themselves off various racketeering and patronage opportunities. And so this benefits obviously the security services, it benefits the political elites in Kinshasa, but it is to the huge detriment of the Congolese population because instead of securing the population, they're actually often extorting uh, and uh, abusing the population and they're allowing the security vacuum to flourish and so this is one of the reasons you have these 100 armed groups emerge in, in the Eastern DRC. So the only way you can deal with the situation in terms of the long term, setting aside the M23 and the, that, that proximate problem, and the long term is with, through greater accountability and transparency. At the moment, politicians are not punished for inaction on 
security in the Eastern DRC. Mm -hmm. And this, despite the enormous, you know, upswelling of democratic um, fervor in the country, we saw this. And I think this is the this is the, the important bright spot in the silver lining of democracy in the Congo that we do need to put on the table in this conversation, which is traditionally the Congolese people have been extremely uh, active in holding and trying to prevent and, and trying to get democracy. Uh, we saw this in 2016 when Congolese people uh, rose up to prevent Joseph Kabila from getting a third term in office. He is the only president in, the, in this region who has been prevented from changing the constitution to do that because of the Congolese people preventing him to do that. Uh, hugely courageous actions by them to pre prevent that from happening. He then tried to impose his own candidate uh, in the 2018 election. He was unable to do so. He ended up striking a deal with the runner up to the detriment of Mr. Fayulu, who's on this call. Um, uh, so obviously the elections were not completely free and fair and yet Joseph Kabila was thwarted in what he wanted to happen. And so democracy has a way of bubbling up from below in, in the DRC. And so I think that diplomats as well as the colonies political elites have not been able to capitalize on that upswelling, on that grassroots momentum for democracy in the DRC. That is what's needed, I think, in terms of security sector reform. That for me is where the hope lies in regards to the security sector, security reforms in the East. I don't believe that MONUSCO, I don't believe that international diplomats in the long term will be able to, uh, to, to bring about the, the, the impetus for accountability necessary. That will come from the Congolese people, but we can do a lot in order to be able to provide, provide the circumstances uh, in which they can in which they can hold their own leaders accountable and we have failed to do so in 2018 we actually were complicit in this um arrangement that provided the presidency to felix Tshisekedi. the u.s government was very active in facilitating that and so i think that hopefully will be uh the international community including the united states government will call the spade a spade this time around and actually try to promote accountability with regards to the electoral process not just in the presidency but also in parliament. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and, and eager to hear the question and answer period. That's fantastic, thank you. And Stephanie, uh, thank you for batting clean up for us and for your patience and uh, for all your great work in the region with uh, OCAPI, as well as the South African Institute for International Affairs. I should have mentioned earlier, you're working on a book on regional players in the East. And I should have mentioned that Mvemba is writing a book about President Mobutu. So a lot of uh, good books in addition to Jason's represented on this panel. But let me turn the floor to you. Love to hear your assessment of how things are in DRC with whatever angle you'd like to emphasize. You're still on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you very much, Great. Mike. Uh, and good to see everybody on the panel today. And uh, thank you very much to Brookings for organizing this event. Um, I wanted to start with, um, I'm gonna stick in the East and stick with some of the peace and security issues. Um, because I think that we're in a moment right now where we have some opportunities that unfortunately, uh, I think both from a regional um, uh, approach and from an international approach, we're unfortunately missing to try and make a dent into some of the things that Jason has just described. And one of the, the one of the biggest concerns I think um, we should be having is that Chisikiti himself is kind of running the response to the way in which things are going in the East and in particular to the M23 crisis as a presidential candidate who's campaigning for the presidency. And what that means is that he's using it in many ways as a diversion from some of the more important issues which have been raised by Mvemba and, 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 and by Fred and by Jason in terms of the political and governance challenges specific to the elections, but also what we should be looking forward to in the DRC, and he's taking a very populist line on um, on this particular crisis. And of course, one of the one of the big um, concerns around that is that there's a lot of anti-Rwandophone sentiment um, uh, throughout the country, and that is the kind of thing that um, Chisakiti has has not done enough, in my view, to try to end. But it also means um, the fact that he's playing this as a presidential candidate also means that he limits many of his options. Um, this has now become the kind of issue that is noticed quite heavily in Kinshasa. Event, events in the East used to be the kind of thing that was, you know, talked about amongst a certain circle in Kinshasa, but it wasn't something that everybody had an opinion on. I think that's changed quite dramatically now, and I think perhaps Fred, Fred can tell us more about that. But today, in, in, in other parts of the DRC, what's happening in the East is very much on everybody's lips, and there's a very kind of um, hostile attitude towards Rwanda, there's a hostile attitude to particular ethnic groups, and there's a very, um, there's almost like a, a an intense 
immense need for some kind of real um, pushback from Kinshasa. And all of that is caught up in these elections and in the way in which Chisikedi has spoken about it and has approached this. Um, I think that we, we, we know that there's been there have been a, a flurry of regional efforts. And the reason why I think it's important to talk about those is because those are opportunities. M23, by no means, as Jason has said very clearly, um, is the only game in town, but it's currently sucking up most of the international attention and most of the international energy and even regional resources in terms of approaches to, to, to how to try and um, end that. And so it's an opportunity, I think, for us to really think about what the region needs to do to try and put an end to some of the the, the recurring drivers of violence in, in, in Eastern DRC. Unfortunately, I think that both the East African community um, and SADC, who isn't yet on the ground, but is meant to be very soon, the East African community um, are taking some of the, are, are following in the footsteps of previous interventions and not looking at the bigger picture. So the East African community, which Congo only joined in March, 2022, um, very much pushed by Uhuru Kenyatta, who was then still the president and who was very close to Chisikiri, has taken a two-track approach um, to, to, the, to the conflict with the M23. One is to send in a regional military force, ECRAF, and the other is to um, mediate uh, something called the Nairobi political talks. Uhuru Kenyatta is mediating those between armed groups from Eastern DRC. Now, the Nairobi talks, um, there have been now four rounds, I think, if I'm not mistaken, um, are talks which have been from the start, the objective of those, of those talks have been unclear. There've only been a certain number of armed groups that have participated. The M23 was kicked out early on, which meant that they were not at the table to discuss. Um, they have a whole separate set of demands and don't wanna be part of Nairobi at this point, um, but they were, they were kicked out early on because of movements along the front line. But I think the Nairobi talks are, are something that at the moment, are very much out of sync with realities on the ground, where we're seeing as a result of the M23 um, fighting coalitions and re-alliances of, of, of armed groups that are now re-galvanizing some of the conflict in the East. And so to try and impose a DDR process and a, and a, and a mediation process that are kind of at odds with what the reality is, um, may not be so effective. So I'm not sure that the Nairobi approach is the one that is the best timed at the moment. Um, when it comes to the East African community's military approach, I mean, much can be said about this. Um, one of the problems, I think, from the get-go has been that, of course, Uganda and, and Burundi in particular have never been neutral players in Eastern DRC, yet they are part of the East African force. And so that's something that we should we should um, think think hard about. The other big um, contributors, troop contributing countries are Kenya and South Sudan. Um, and we've, we've, we've seen really a situation on the ground where from the East African community be, being seen as kind of a, um, not so much a savior, but a helpful force, very quickly that relationship turning sour, um, both local opposition in Eastern DRC and North Kivu in particular to the East African community force, and then some very um, um, undiplomatic, I would say, things said by key members of Chisikidi's uh, um, government about how the East African force wasn't efficient, was simply creating buffer zones and wasn't doing what Chisikidi wanted it to do, which was to go after the M23. Now, the East African community pushes back and says that was never our mandate. We were never going to be aggressive and chase the M23 away. And that has become a st key sticking point between the two and a very um, publicly played out diplomatic spat between between a regional, regional community that has just committed troops and resources into DRC and that is now being essentially pushed away by that very same government that had invited it in. Um, so that's that's obviously an issue of, of great concern. There is now uh, the at the end of the EAC mandate is coming in the next few weeks, and we'll see whether it does get renewed. But as these tensions were building, Chisikedi very quickly turned to a former ally who he had forgotten about for many years, and that was Sadek. Um, and so Sadek... Um, the Southern African Development Community, which the last time that there was an M23 crisis sent in uh, troops from Tanzania, Malawi, and, um, and South Africa as part of the Force Intervention Brigade, has now decided to send in also a military force into Eastern DRC. Now, we don't know many of the details, 
Um, but this is meant to be happening very soon. There have been delays apparently in the logistics and we don't even know who the troop contributing countries are. But obviously this is another purely military approach to a problem that in many ways has no, no clear military solution. On top of that, we're going to have the East African community forces potentially still on the ground. We have MONUSCO forces on the ground. We have the Congolese army and now potentially also a SADC, uh, a SADC army. I mean, this is a lot of uh, armies to have in a small place with no real coordination, no clarity on who will be uh, in command of any of this, what the lines of, of, of communication will even be. So uh, adding, I think, a, a lot of complications to the situation in the Eastern DRC. Um, finally, the Luanda process, which is being led by Joao Lorenzo, the president of Angola, is meant to be the political process um, that I think we need to widen to a much wide, much bigger set of players, so include Uganda and Burundi. And that's something that is really there to try and keep Paul Kagame and uh, Chisikiri speaking uh, about this particular crisis. But it hasn't really moved the needle on that in any uh, substantive way. And so we, we're kind of stuck there as well. It has come up with the Luanda roadmap, which is still the kind of um, uh, framework for the, the, the modalities of M23, cantonment, and so on and so forth. But that is really something that has faded very much, unfortunately, into the background in the last few months as no real progress has been made. So in a nutshell, we have a lot of military approaches, few political approaches. Those that we do have are, are maybe ill-timed and others aren't fully inclusive to, I think, address some of the big drivers of the conflict that we do have. And it's an opportunity. Um, a lot of resources are going to go into the East African force. Uh, the SADC force is meant to cost $550 million just for one year. So uh, are these the right is this the right thing to be spending money on when we, we could be widening a conversation and perhaps addressing it differently? That's the question I want to end on. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we have good news and bad news about where we are in the panel discussion. The bad news is we only have about 20 minutes left. The good news is you all have covered so many of the issues that I think it sets us up for a punchy final round in which everyone can please feel the liberty to drive home a specific policy idea, proposal, or agenda item that you probably have already touched upon. But now I'm going to go in reverse order, if I could, starting with Stephanie and Jason, and stay in the East for a minute and then come back uh, to Fred and Mbemba and give Mr. Feyulu a chance for any uh, brief final thoughts as well. But Stephanie, in, given the context that you've just described, that you and Jason and the rest of the panel have just described, what could possibly be a promising path forward? I mean, I'm also haunted by Jason's explanation of the economic incentives for certain actors, certain countries to see this thing continue and to see the chaos continue. Mr. Feyulu talked about a much stronger UN mission with a different mandate and a more assertive mandate uh, as perhaps a way to organize all these disparate elements. I wondered if you had a preferred course of action that you think really has any kind of a realistic chance in the term of the next presidential uh, election in Congo. Well, I mean, I think that we, it, 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 yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think that we, we, we need to be starting to speak about this regional conversation quite seriously. And I, I, I think it's very clear that there are huge numbers of interests in keeping instability in the, in the, in the Eastern DRC going. Who bears the consequences for that? Um, you know, the, the consequences are disproportionately borne by, by Congolese citizens and by the Congolese population. And so how much longer do we want that to go on for? Yes, there are, there are issues on the Congolese side that need to absolutely be addressed and that go to the heart of how power works in the DRC, including what Jason described earlier about the Congolese army and the patronage networks and the kind of outsourcing of, of, of those types of issues and, 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 and the, the breakdown of governance. Absolutely, those need to be discussed internally and that brings us back to elections, which is why we need a credible uh, government that is willing to tackle some of these issues and can do the difficult things that inevitably dismantling those patronage networks within the Congolese army will, will, will mean. But we have to have a conversation at a regional level about what, what's driving Rwanda's interests, what's driving Uganda's, in, Uganda's interests. And we can't do some of that if we don't also have the international community pushing that. Um, I mean, we, we know that the EU sanctioned one um, Rwandan Defense Force officer uh, recently for his role in, in Eastern Congo. Um, I mean, I think that that just isn't enough. It, 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 I don't know how many times we have to keep going through variations of what we're going through now, where we have UN reports state very clearly what's at play here, and then we don't have consequences. 
Um, and so inevitably, that's that's part part of what has to happen. The political will has to come from the region, but there has to be a there has to be there has to be consensus, I think, in the international community that we can't continue to treat this as a national conflict only because we do still do that far too often. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. And Jason, if I could go to you for any thoughts you've got, but also I'd like to hear, if, if you don't mind, your suggestions for how Washington and other Western capitals can do better this time than they did last time, since you were pretty compelling in your critique of the way the 2018 situation was handled. So love to hear your best suggestions going forward. Thank you. Well, I don't disagree, I think, with anything that Stephanie just said, unsurprisingly. I think that we do need a combination of a strong process and uh, pressure. Uh, to make this process work. So it's it a process as well as some sticks and carrots to make that process work. At the moment, we don't. As Stephanie pointed out, the Nairobi process is sort of dysfunctional. The Luanda process is as well. Uh, dysfunctional, I think, largely because there's not enough leadership. Uh, the Kenyan leadership has fizzled out um, uh, largely. At the parties at the table have vastly different approaches, uh, worldviews. Uh, as well as interests at the table. And so there's just nothing, this, it's a process that's stuck. Um, I do think, and I agree here with what Stephanie is saying, that we need to have more international pressure, especially on Rwanda and Uganda, especially Rwanda, to get this thing unstuck. I mean, this is the playbook. This is the third time that we've had a resurgence of the, M or an appearance of the M23, if you include its predecessor, the CNDP. 2008, the CNDP was solved through a deal, through international pressure, and a deal between Rwanda and the Congo that saw the CNDP integrate into the Congolese army and some of its leaders arrested. In 2013, again, international pressure led to a deal where Rwanda pulled the plug on the M23. It collapsed and went into exile. And so I, I think, again, there needs to be the, 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 the solution to this problem has to come through pressure on Rwanda and some sort of deal. Um, that deal is going to have to also include the Congolese government, right? There's going to need to be people coming together. But I think for people to come together, an impetus has to be pressure on the Rwandan government. Now, why haven't we seen that? And what are people in Washington telling me? I speak often with people in the White House and in the National Security Establishment and the Foreign Policy Establishment in, in, in Washington, D.C., as well as elsewhere. One problem is, is that the, the U.S. actually, in this case, um, they were... They came out most forcefully amongst donor countries. And since around uh, mid last year, mid 2022, they were forcefully condemning Rwanda's support to the, to the M23, going so far in more recent uh, declarations to say that the, the Rwandan government doesn't need to just end support to the M23, but they need to withdraw their troops from the Eastern DRC. The State Department sees actually a large part of the fighting happening by Rwandan troops in the Eastern DRC. That's much more forceful earlier than other countries. And I think that's good. Problem is it wasn't backed up by anything tangible, uh, anything material or anything concrete. One of the reasons for this, according to the State Department, I think they're right, is, is that they're just there's a complete divergence between the US, the French, and the UK. The UK hasn't even condemned. The UK, in fact, has been in, in, embarked on this very questionable uh, asylum deal with the Rwandan government uh, that sees all asylum applicants to the UK deported, or many of them at least, or are, this has been now blocked in courts, but were supposed to be deported to Rwanda. And instead of getting asylum in the UK, they would get asylum in Rwanda. Um, this is a deal that's extremely questionable, but it's bound the UK government together with the Rwandan government. The French have uh, other interests. Macron, he's part of his legacy, is reestablishing relations with the Rwandan government. He doesn't want to jeopardize that. The French and the Rwandans have obviously going back to the genocide, very, very uh, fraught relationship. And he's reestablished that. He visited uh, Kigali. He apologized for the French role in, in, in the genocide. Uh, and he doesn't want to jeopardize that. Over and beyond that, the French have interest. The largest French company uh, in terms of revenues in the world, Total Energy, is being protected in the northern Mozambique by the Rwandan, Rwandan army that's deployed there against the uh, is Islamist movement in northern Mozambique. Um, and the Rwandans have leveraged their, uh, their export of, of the Rwandan army as peacekeepers, as security, uh, as security providers across Africa. And this is something that not only charms the, the French, they're currently embarked, uh, 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 beginning to embark in Benin, in northern Benin. They're active in the Central African Republic, both as peacekeepers as well as a bilateral force in the Central African Republic uh, and, and in Mozambique. So increasingly, the Rwandans are projecting the military force 
And this, of course, is a counterbalance to Wagner. And people in the Defense Department in the U.S. recognize this and say that. And so as you have some people in, in the State Department pushing and putting pressure on Rwanda, you have other people in the U.S. security establishment actually quite appreciative of what Rwanda can do in terms of a counterweight to, to Wagner in CAR, but potentially also elsewhere in, in Africa. And so this is why there hasn't been, I think, and this is what people in Washington tell me is they'll, and, and I think many of them are quite frustrated, is that they'll be speaking up and saying we need to do more. Some of them talking about actually going more, being more forceful about sanctions. In 2013, around $300 million in aid was suspended from Rwanda. That, that made them act. You don't have a similar sort of thing. So I would agree with Stephanie that, that needs, there needs to be an impetus there. And the burden to a certain large extent is on the people who are spending hundreds of millions of dollars in aid to Rwanda at a time when Rwanda is invading a neighboring country. So I would just, I would just put that there. Um, in terms of your other question, I'll try to be very brief in terms of what, what can be done uh, on, on elections. I, I'm not optimistic with regards to this cycle for a variety of reasons. The entire electoral apparatus is politicized. The electoral, as Mr. Fayulu and others have pointed out, as Fred has pointed out, the electoral commission is politicized. The, the judiciary is deeply politicized, and that's also due to Chisikedi. Civil society is deeply divided and politicized. So our civil society came together as one and made a coalition with the opposition against uh, Kabila standing for another term in 2018. In this case, opposition is divided and civil society is divided. And I think that that as well is a big problem. So I'm not, I'm not optimistic. Um, we should say also that Chisikedi in our polling is quite popular. So uh, I think that that, as well as his control of the electoral apparatus, gives him a huge upper hand in these, in, these coming, in these coming elections. So I think the important thing here is, as I said before, just to be, to be frank and not let our geopolitical concerns override the more important concerns, I think, uh, regarding democracy. There is a huge push in Washington at the moment to see everything in the Congo through the lens of geopolitical rivalry with China. I don't think that's beneficial to anybody, certainly not to the Congolese people. Um, and so I don't think that we should let that override the need to speak out, to say things as they are, to fund the, the important civil society organizations uh, that are working on democracy in, in the DRC, and to continue a much more, I think, aggressive and forthright diplomacy on these issues. You know, with regards to the M23 as, as the elections, what we can see is that there is just no drive in the international community for visionary diplomacy in the Great Lakes. And that, especially in the African, in the African context, the African Union has, I think, been extremely uh, uh, weak on this crisis. That's allowed sort of what Stephanie described as the fizzling out of the political process. But that's also backed by, by the US. You know, In the past, when we've seen political processes work, uh, we saw this with Russ Feingold as a special envoy uh, of the US government in 2012, 2013. We saw this during the, the great wars of, of Congo to uh, 1996 to 2003 with much more, I think, visionary leadership by, by the US government that eventually overcame some of these entrenched interests that I'm describing. I think we need a resurgence of that today in Washington as well as elsewhere. Thank you very, very much. Fred, over to you to drive home whatever point you think is most crucial at this juncture? Well, uh, I have many things to say and, and just a few minutes, but if I may start by, by democracy itself, and, and um, I would like to say that the, there's a crisis of democracy uh, everywhere, and this election in DRC, I think um, we should see it not an, only as an isolated process, but as a process uh, that is going um, wrong as in many other countries in the, in, in the continent. And this is important in, in this particular moment when we see the resurgence of coup in, in, uh, in Western Africa and when people see more and more military coup, but we should not uh, forget that when people tend to support those coups, especially young people, is also because they don't see an election alternative actually electoral coup, uh, which um, almost in many African countries uh, tend to be supported by the same countries that are criticizing the military coup. Um, this happened in, in, in DRC at least in 2011 and in 2018, and probably will likely happen uh, in, in coming, coming uh, months. 
So as we are going through the electoral process, I think we should uh, recognize that a weak or a non-transparent and a rigged electoral process not only uh, is bad for DRC, but it is also bad for, uh, in some to some extent, to to the democratic dynamic in um, in the African continent. And maybe it may be beneficial for everybody that we have a real uh, democratic election and. I think we have less and less chance to see that happening in um, in December this year, but still uh, we should all be uh, measuring the risk that we are facing as a country and as a, as, a, as a continent. Other than that, I would say most of the time the electoral processes, like the because of the quality of the election, most of the debates in the uh, last. 20 years, I would say, are around the quality of the process rather than on the uh, policy proposals that uh, uh, has to be uh, discussed during this electoral process. And we saw this in this electoral process. There is very less uh, discussion on what kind of um, security uh, policy, what kind of economic policy, what kind of um, foreign policy to propose, and all is all the, the, the debate are captured by uh, is this going to be a free and fair election? So as long as we have really, uh, not free and not fair elections, somehow the the, the uh, substance the, the substance of uh, of the um, elect democracy is also being undermined. Uh, maybe to finish with with a couple of points. Um, one is that the I think on 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 security in the east there is both Congo fatigue and also there is a high level of of international community fatigue from Congolese people uh, on how the uh, donors are trying to not to resolve the deep root of the conflict or to address them or even to, to, to touch them, but to stabilize a certain level of instability. And this was the discourse in, the, in 2018 uh, after the election, the, the argument that I was hearing from uh, Paris to New York to Washington DC was that this uh, consensus or that deal was good for, for stability in the East. What we had is is uh, growing instability, um, and I think that those kind of arguments not only maybe may have a, a higher level of racism, uh, but they they came from the idea that we as Congolese people we are not able to resolve our our own problem. Although sometimes they they are very against. The popular mobilization that is happening as a consequence is people are, are, are tired of many aspects of the international community or the way it has been intervening in the east part of the mobilization against monusco that we've been seeing since 2019 at least is due to the uh that feeling of uh monusco having being a strong presence of the international community but also a weak presence in, in the way to address uh, long-term roots of the conflict, but also on the responsabilizing Congress government. So I think the, it's for, for many people, for, for the majority, I think if you ask Congress people, we lack MONUSCO to go, not only because they think it is uh, an, an effective in addressing uh, security concerns, but because we need to have a government that is more responsible in its uh, mandate to take care of security of, of its citizen. We need to see more of the security sector reform, the army to be equipped, to the, the condition of, of the military to be improved. Uh, we need to see uh, a police, a national police that we can trust. We need to know the security forces that we can um, uh, we, we can trust, we, we need to have a coherent foreign policy and we, we should stop, Congress government should stop to uh, uh, externalize it, externalize its uh, response to its security concern. Every time there is a major conflict, we, we turn to ASC, we turn to SADC, we turn to the MONUSCO, and then we reform, we reform the MONUSCO. But unless we take seriously and unless other countries take seriously the need uh, to 
have a functional state in DRC with functional institution, uh, the judiciary, the army, the, uh, uh, the politics, and a, a give tools to people to hold them to account, we will not have a solution in this region. And, and this way of supporting weak institutions only because they maintain a acceptable level of instability is uh, very wrong. And I think dealing, seeing how it is being proposed, it has um, a very high level of racism. Thank you. Thank you. And we admire and wish you well with the work you're doing with uh, Abu Tele and also um, Loot for the Changement and everything else you do uh, with and in Congo. And Vemba, over to you. And then we'll have a final word for Mr. Fayulu if he'd like and wrap up. Thank you, Mike. Um, I think uh, Mr. Fayulu, Fred, and all my other co-panelists have actually framed the issue pretty well. I think at this point, when it comes to elections, the train has left the station. I think uh, the last four years were wasted in terms of putting in place the right structure with the right processes to do that. However, all is not lost. We have uh, the US as a new ambassador in, in DRC. We hope there will be a real break from the approach that her predecessor took. Uh, the year before, uh, the last few years, we had the US that was very much a cheerleader, uh, slogan churning, supporter of the Chisekedi government, knowing very well that there were serious flaws from the last election. So we hope that Ambassador Tamlin will be strong and is standing fast in support. We know this process is flawed, but we cannot continue supporting this kind of business as usual approach. We should stop with the law, the bigotry of law expectation for DRC. I think that we expect so little of the DRC when in fact, civil society and society at large and the Congolese citizen at large work hard for democracy. The context in which we live today, Fred mentioned Niger and what's happening in Sahel, is not far from what can happen in places like Central Africa. The frustrations are the same. So the DRC itself, I'm personally a deep believer in DRC taking leadership for its own future. We've not seen that. Um, we always, gang up on the DRC. I use that term, gang up. Forgive me, but that's the term I'll use. I'm not uh, a big supporter of these regional processes. There's no sense to bring the entire region to a fight where we know who the protagonists are. Yeah, In the East, it's Rwanda, DRC, and Uganda. So why not have peace with those? Because the regional processes presuppose that everybody has the best interests of the DRC at heart. They don't. They have their own interests. And those countries have no interest in seeing a Congo that works. Therefore, the mission of making the Congo works rests on the Congolese. Uh, as I said earlier, I think there was a lot of wasted opportunities, particularly on the Chisekedi side. There was a level of naivete that I'm going to do things better than everybody else and not connecting to what the people really want. So I'm insisting again on this role of having a visionary leadership in the country. The US can play a major role, even though the electoral train has, has already left the station, by strengthening civil society. They're divided now, like Jason says, but there are still strong processes, strong initiatives taking place within civil society. Political parties are weak. They barely are political parties. Right, the individual structure with family members, with clan, and so on. The DRC need structural organizational support to build political parties. The likes of NED, National Endowment for Democracy, IRI, SAID, NDI need to be more present in supporting that work. Because until then, we'll continue having all this frustration that we continue to have. So I expect that the US should step up to its role, uh, particularly in helping Congo restructure. We cannot wait for the day where everything falls and then start su suspending aid and then wondering what happened. We know what has happened over the last 20 years. We know exactly what happened. So we as the West, well, as much as I am a big proponent of Congo pulling out of all these processes 
and try to rebuild its own um, its own ways internally, and then deal with this neighbor directly. Pull out of the Nairobi process. Pull out the Addis Ababa framework. Those processes have not worked. They've done what Fred says. Just, as Fred has said, just keep the bare minimum. So that's not going to work. But as much as I'm a pro proponent of that, I believe the U.S. particularly has a role to play in pushing Congo forward in taking its own responsibility. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mbamba, and thank you all. Mr. Fayulu, if you're still there and you would like to add a final word, no obligation to, we already benefited greatly, but please, the floor is yours for sort of a final benediction, if you will, or wrap up comment. Uh, sir, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Mike. Thank you for the old panelists. And uh, I uh, really, uh, I agree with them on many things, but just a few things. Uh, what Mbamba said, about the politician disappointment, the Congolese politician disappointment. I just want to say that, please, don't think that uh, all Congolese politicians are the same, and then you put them on the same back basket. You have corrupt politicians, and you have others who really uh, behave according to principles and according to values. All of us, we are not the same. You have some, they need money, they change because the situation has changed. I think uh, we have to see what is go going on in the country and who has done what. Uh, secondly, I totally agree um, with uh, uh, Jason for uh, the need for democracy of Congolese people. That need is huge. Congolese want, if you see, when we demonstrate in this country without military, militias, UDPS bringing his people with machete, but you still have youth, you still have old women, men going on the street to demonstrate. It's very, very uh, huge. When on June 19th, I said no election without a uh, electoral file that uh, audited by an external body. And people thought that I was mad, but if you see, how the people of Congo has uh, uh, joining me for that, that, including the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church. And you see that the need for democracy is huge in uh, uh, this country. And also I agree with uh, Stephanie and uh, Vemba when they say that uh, the Eastern African community, the SADC, all, all those solutions are not solutions. We really need uh, the uh, what is crucial into this country is the legitimate institutions and the rulers to achieve uh, just what the Fred said. We need the election, the transparent, inclusive, impartial uh, election. So we uh, Congolese people will uh, vote for those who present their program and note that you wait until the situation gets worse. And then you come and say, we have taken notes and we agree and this and that. Please, uh, what I, we need, the world, the uh, Democrats all over the world to help Congolese people to have legitimate institution through free, fair and peaceful elections. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all. And to everyone joining us here in North America, there in Congo and everywhere else, uh, we certainly wish the Congolese people the very best in these coming months and years ahead. And I really want to give a personal thank you to all the panelists, as well as my colleagues at Brookings, uh, Melissa Perez Sancho, Alejandra Rocha, and others, because uh, this brought together a lot of talent and a lot of ideas. And I think it's an important moment in Congo's history. So with best wishes, certainly for the rest of the summer, but definitely for Congo going into the fall and uh, with hopes for a successful election in future. Signing off now from Brookings. Thank you again for joining us, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.